All right, we continue here live from Las Vegas at the fourth period gifting suites at the Encore Hotel. The 2014 NHL Awards will soon be upon us. Former National Hockey Leaguer Anson Carter now joins us. How you doing, Anson? Good. How you doing? I'm doing real, real well. Now, what's it been like for you lately to, to see it from our side of things? You're doing a great job at the NBC Sports Network, of course, and uh, you've got a lot going on with the NHL Network and that sort of thing. Uh, how much have you enjoyed that experience? I loved it. I mean, I keep telling people I've crossed over the dark side. <laughs> you know, as a player, you always saw media as a necessary evil, but now being on the other side of the fence, you kind of understand – what the media has to do is their job in terms of storytelling and getting the message out there. But at the same time, I know from being a player how important it is to get the, the story correct. It's not mm-hmm. about being first, it's about being correct and being honest and about being up front with the players. You were a big part of the National Hockey League for a long time as well. And I said to Commissioner Bettman a little bit earlier, the National Hockey League, I guess you could make the case, has never been stronger. And I said earlier as well, Anson, that there are very few fires to put out around the National <laughs> Hockey League right now. Salary cap may be expected to be about $71.1 million, somewhere in that neighborhood coming up for next season. Uh, what have you made of the success of the National Hockey League here of late? I think it's great. I don't think people have mentioned the L word, the lockout, but coming out of the lockout, uh, there's a lot of question marks in, in terms of what's going to happen in the league and where the league's going to go. I think first and foremost, you have the players. You've got great product on the ice, but the league's done a really good job with marketing the game. Mm-hmm. You know, it's outdoor games that have been outstanding. Uh, the changes they've made with the uh, actual rules of the game as well, too, have sped the game up, made it more appealing for fans to watch. But I think also the partnerships that you have with these national broadcasting partnerships in Canada and the United States have been outstanding with getting more games on TV. So now people can't complain and say, well, we're not seeing our teams on TV anymore. That's, that's not an excuse anymore. Now you're seeing more games than ever on TV. But in addition to that, you also see the initiative being put forward with focusing on online. So now you've got the Internet, too. So that helps expand our audience overseas as well. Now, that five-game Stanley Cup final series didn't seem like a (laughs) five-game traditional Stanley Cup final series. I mean, there was a lot more to it. It was a lot more compelling than I think a lot of people would probably look at years down the road when you see the Kings won the Stanley Cup in 2014 in five games. What did you make of that that Stanley Cup final and Los Angeles winning its second Stanley Cup championship in just over 24 months? I was extremely disappointed watching that series come to an end. You know, I was sitting there. And I was watching the game, and I was sitting there thinking to myself, you know, I, I can't believe this is over right now. You know, I was sitting in the room with Sam Flood from NBCSN mm-hmm. and, and sitting there with Gary Bettman as well, and we're, we're, we're just chomping the bit thinking this could be a great game six going back to New York City. We can't wait. It'll be exciting. It'll be great for TV. And then all of a sudden it was over, just like that. And you see the, the, the score, and you see, you know, the, the scores of the game and the, the records and the four games to one and what have you. But you're right. It was a lot closer series than that. A couple bounces here, a couple bounces there. I think New York – Wish they probably could have probably split one of those first two games there in L.A. to start the series off because New York's been a heck of a road team all season long. But they weren't able to get that lucky bounce they needed, it, and L.A. was able to carry that good fortune forward and um, you know close it out in home ice, and their fans were able to see them hoist the cup on, on home ice once again. Anson Carter joining us here live from Las Vegas as we continue with the 2014 NHL Awards. Uh, earlier today, a couple of news items came up. Scott Hartnell to Columbus. R.J. Umberger goes back to Philadelphia along with a fourth-round pick. Uh, your thoughts on the deal? My initial reaction was I like this, especially from the Blue Jackets' standpoint. I think it's a wash. I think they're both similar players. Mm-hmm. I think a situation where uh, Umberger could use a change of scenery, and I feel this Hartnell is exactly the same thing. Uh, one thing with Philadelphia, they're not afraid to upgrade their roster. They're always tweaking it at some point, trying to figure out what find the missing piece to get back to the Stanley Cup, and I like that about an organization. Um, you see with guys like J.D. and, and Columbus, uh, they're really trying to take that next step. So they're not very content with just being in the playoffs now. They knew that they could have possibly upset Pittsburgh in that first round. They didn't do it. But now they want to take that next step. And the Columbus fan base, I played there before. I know exactly what they're going through. They're, they're hungry for a winner there. So I think you're, you're, you're just interchanging two parts that they're similar players, but they need to f- change the scenery. And as a player, sometimes you get stale in one situation. So I think both guys will come to training camp fresh and excited and ready to go. Well, we think about your career too, and we remember you and the Sedin twins and some of the numbers you guys put up. It was <laughs> one, of, one of your best seasons and a very good NHL career. Willie Desjardins, the new head coach of the Vancouver Canucks. And you want to talk about a team and a franchise that's had a, a bit of a change of pace here lately, to say the least, uh, with Mike Gillis going out, of course, and Trevor Linden coming in. John Tortorella was out after one year as coach of the Vancouver Canucks, and now Desjardins in there. Uh, of course, Jim Penning takes over as the general manager, replacing Mike Gillis. Uh, what do you make of Willie Desjardins getting this opportunity after having paid his dues in junior hockey in the NHL as an assistant and, of course, as a Calder Cup winning coach of the Texas Stars? Well, you said it right there. He paid his dues. You know, I'm really sick and tired of seeing players, not players, sorry, seeing managers and even coaches getting recycled all the time. I mean, there's a reason why these guys got fired. 
You know, and as a player, you, you see these guys getting recycled all the time, and it's like they're in a lifetime scholarship. Just because you've done it once before doesn't mean you do it well. So a guy like Willie Desjardins, then, who's, who's done it before, he's really paid his dues at junior level mm -hmm. in Medicine Hat. Uh, he's won the Calder Championship in the AHL. So the, he's a proven winner. You know, a guy like Cooper, same thing in Tampa Bay. Yeah. I, I love seeing these guys that haven't had the opportunity to, to coach the National Hockey level get that chance to coach at the highest level because you never know what they could bring to the table. But I think they get a fresh set of ideas, fresh eyes, um, fresh way of doing things, and it's a quote-unquote new NHL, so I think the game really benefits from having these new guys bring these new different philosophies to the table. It's hard to believe at this point, Anson, that the Pittsburgh Penguins are still without a head coach. <laughs> uh, Dan Bilesma, we saw him at the Stanley Cup final, of course, and uh, he's still winning in the wings and uh, has a pretty good severance package right now, at least, mm -hmm. to, to build off of, and he can pick and choose for the future where he wants to land, but it's hard to believe the Pens at this point are still looking for a head coach. Whether it was Willie Desjardins or whether it was Bill Peters, uh, they thought they had their guy. At the last second, he got scooped up. And I mean, what's happened to the Pittsburgh Penguins here off the ice here in terms of the way that they're looked at here the last couple of weeks, the last couple of months? It's a tough situation. I, I think they held off from firing Bilesma because they didn't want him to go to Washington. Mm -hmm. I thought that would have been a good situation for him to be in a step in that situation. But uh, Pittsburgh's a complicated place to, to, to walk into. When you've got Sidney Crosby, you've got Geno Malkin, two of the best players in the world. Your goaltending situation isn't solidified yet because you don't know what's going to happen with Fleury. Uh, their back end isn't perfect, and they don't have depth in the back end um, in terms of their, their bottom six forwards. There's a lot of question marks there, and there's going to be a lot of pressure to go in there and perform right away, whereas these other places like Florida where they're rebuilding, Vancouver, the expectations might not be as high. I don't think there's much pressure as a coach, so therefore your shelf life might be a little bit longer, whereas you go into Pittsburgh, you're expected to win right away because those two main pieces that you have there in Malkin and Crosby. So when you're looking at it from that standpoint, it might not be the ideal place for a coach to go in there. You have to have the right special coach to go in there and handle those, those, those eagles that are in that room. You know, we were talking before we came on here for this segment, Anson, about the fact that, you know, you played for Stan Butler at Wexford, you went on to Michigan State and that sort of thing. Uh, it, it's amazing to, to think about the collegiate route versus the Ontario Hockey League route or the CHL route, if you will, uh, and the battle that goes on these days to make sure you get the kids. And I think that's why we've seen so much with David Branch stepping up with that exemption rule where you've got 15-year-old kids like Ekblad being granted that type of an exemption to keep them in the Canadian Hockey League. Take me back to your time coming out of Wexford where you, you were a champion, certainly in Ontario Junior Loop, and your decision to go to Michigan State to play for the Spartans. For, for myself, personally, it wasn't as difficult a decision as some of these other kids coming up. Uh, I was what you'd call a late bloomer. I played baseball and I played hockey in the summertime in Toronto. Um, even one year I was cut from the Toronto Red Wings. <laughs> I ended up playing with Don Mills Flyers at the time. And it was a pretty easy decision. My parents always wanted me to go play college hockey. That was the goal for me. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't to play junior hockey. I remember when I was uh, 16, when I could have gotten drafted by the junior team. Um, I remember Sudbury Wolves were looking at me, and I wasn't that big. Even when I was drafted by the National Hockey League team, I was 150 pounds as an 18-year-old. So it took me a while to sort of grow into my frame, and I wasn't ready to leave home yet. And I hadn't dedicated my life to playing at an NHL level. Because at that age, you just don't know. Even now, I tell kids, you don't know if you're going to play the National Hockey League until you're 19 or 20, until you become a man. So I figured going to, going to Michigan State gave me a chance to develop as a person, but as a player, and I could really take my time. And if I didn't like it at school, I could have always went back and played junior hockey. I was drafted by Detroit CompuWare with Jimmy Rutherford at the time. Right. He came to my house. My brother and I were playing ball hockey in front of my house, and Jimmy Rutherford pulls up, and he's trying to sell me on coming to Detroit. But I, I thought going to college was the best thing for me. And even when I went to our team Canada to play World Juniors, Todd Harvey played in those great um, Detroit teams, and Harvey was like, man, you got to come play with us. Pat Peek is here. we got the best team in the OHL. be great. You're still living in the States. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't about living in the United States for me. It was about getting that college education and really developing as a player and as a person, more importantly, that I could take my talents to the next level to get to National Hockey. Because I understood that. It isn't so much about having the talent to play. You've got to be mentally ready to play at that level because you're playing with men. You're not playing with boys. Did you wear number 15 for Wexford? I did. Isn't that unbelievable? It's pretty good I can memory. remember something <laughs> from over 20 memory. years ago at Scarborough Arena. He wore number 15, and I can't remember what I had for dinner last night. Unbelievable. Memory. I wonder to wear number 85, but uh, I used to love Peter Klima. But yeah. Coach Butler wouldn't Without the it. helmet. Uh, let me wrap up with you, though, Anson, and talking about aside from the broadcasting thing, you've got your hands in so many different cookie jars here. You've done really well in life after hockey. And we're glad you're still a part of it in, in some aspects as well. But tell me about some of the other things you've got going on in the business world because it's real important for the players of today to realize that it doesn't last forever. 
that you want to make sure that you've got something to fall back on when the applause stops. It goes by so quick. I mean, before you blink your eyes, you, you realize that you're just training, getting ready for your first training camp, and all of a sudden your career is over, and, you know, what do you do now? And it's not like we're old. You know, I, I finished playing, I'd say, what, six years ago? And I just turned 40 like, last week or the week before, so 34 years old, that's a relatively young man still. So when I played uh, with the lockout, 04, 05, and I started Big Up Entertainment at the time, I mm-hmm. produced my first feature film, I was able to produce a rap group, Main and Burst. We, we climbed number six in the college uh, rap charts. Right. But iTunes killed that business, so I got out of the music business and more developing projects for film and TV. Uh, developed a clothing line called SOM, S-O-M-B, called Shirt Off My Back, SOM.com, with a bunch of guys I would skate all the time in California with my agent, Pat Brisson at CAA, and mm-hmm. Jerry Bruckheimer on Sunday. So we had a bunch of guys that we used to hang out and go for adult beverages with after we skated, and we'd all talk about wanting to get invisible with one another. But at the same time, we didn't want to just do it just for the sake of doing it. We wanted to give back to the community. So we figured that starting up SOM was an opportunity for us to sell clothing and for every article of clothing that we sell, we're able to donate a full school uniform for a kid to go to school in Africa. Well, it's fantastic stuff that you've got going on. Thank you very much for stopping by. Enjoy Thank the next you. couple of days here. You bet.